denomination on a global basis engaged in a project called Imagine No Malaria. The goal of that project was to eliminate all the cause of death on a worldwide basis for malaria. And the goal of our denomination was to raise $83 million. Other churches, I know for a fact that the Lutheran Church is engaged in this too, but collectively the goal of the project was to eliminate the death from malaria. Our goal here in Wisconsin was to raise a million dollars as part of our denomination's worldwide goal of 83. Our, our church conference, the Wisconsin Conference, all 460 congregations, including Portage United Methodist Church, reached and exceeded that goal of a million dollars. In June of this year, we raised over a million dollars, one million twenty-three thousand dollars to contribute towards that. And as a result of that work, the global death rate for malaria has already been cut in half within a year. So I think that's just a great example of the greater, you know, the Think Greater. Our, our stewardship program this year is called Think Greater. But think of that. Think about the great work we can do when we apply ourselves to the calling that God has given to us. So today we start the work uh, here at Portage United Methodist Church, the greater work that we have to do in 2017. In the past four and a half months, you've heard a number of ministry minutes. Um, Dave Briggs was up here in June and talked about our education ministry. Um, Mike Lindner and Nikki Briggs talked about our music ministry. Uh, Barb Berg talked about our mission ministry. Cheryl Lenoya, Mark Hurd talked about our outreach ministry. And every one of them talked about the relationships, the relationships that we have amongst each other here as our ministry continues. And so I want you to think about the greater work that we can do based on the relationship that we have with each other. We're about to launch our 2017 stewardship uh, campaign. You received a letter this week uh, in the mail, and uh, it was Tom's letter, and we appreciate that. It was really well done. And I think the letter that he wrote in our messenger was just exceptional, talking about the challenge that we have this, in 2017 and how we're called to serve God in that way. Next week, in the mail, you will receive your commitment card. And two weeks from today, we want those cards back with our pledge of what we anticipate each of us will do uh, to further God's work here. So uh, we ask you, you know, one, of the exam one of the concerns we have is that we're not meeting our expenses. We had to suspend, as a church, our apportionment giving. This is the money that we as a church give back to our Wisconsin Conference and to the Global Church. We had to suspend that in uh, March, and we've re-engaged it now, but we had to suspend it for a while in order to cover our operating expenses. So we're challenged financially to do the work that we know we need to do here and, and actually do even greater work. So if you're not already tithing, I ask you to think about, can you give the tithe? Wouldn't you want to give the tithe? A tithing church is not going to have a financial problem, so we need to perfectly consider that. And if you're unable to do that, then can you increase your giving by 1%? Think about 1%. You know, if you're giving $10, that's another dime. I mean, 1% would go a long way if each of us did that. And then one other thing that each of us can do is there are people not here with us today. We have members or friends that aren't worshiping with us today. We need to reach out and contact those people and invite them back to help share in the work that we do here. So in closing, as you prayerfully consider your giving for 2017, I'd ask you a question. Can you accept God's promise to provide you in abundance? Can you accept that? If you look at Pastor Tom's letter, he closed it with um, Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. God asks you to test him, says the Lord God Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. God asks you to test him. Test him by giving the tithe. So today we kick off our stewardship drive. We'll conclude it in two weeks. And as you reflect on all that God has done, and as you think about the relationships that we share at our church, I'd ask you to think greater as part of our calling. And I'd like to leave you with a quote from John 14, 12. Jesus said to us, Very truly I tell you, Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. Thank you.
I get to hear that twice. So there. <laughs> Except my other Bible, but not this one. Uh, Matthew, this is from Matthew chapter 5. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the evil one. Whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other as well. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat too. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go two miles. Give to the one who asks of you. <clears throat> Sorry. It actually says, lend to the one who wants to borrow from you, and do not turn them away. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you this, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be true children of the Father who is in heaven for God causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, sends rain on both righteous and unrighteous. So if you, if you love those who love you back, what reward do you have? Even tax collectors do that. If you greet only your own family, what do you do any more than anybody else? The Gentiles do that. So you are to be entirely true as your heavenly father is entirely true. One of the issues we face in our lives is, is how we feel when we feel powerless. Because there are situations that we have no control over. You know, whether it rains or snows, you have no control over. Um, whether it's cold, whether it's hot. There's a ton of things that we don't have control over. And, and when we feel, we've gotten used to accepting certain things, but in our relationships with other people, there's stuff we're powerless over. And that makes us feel vulnerable and afraid and uh, somehow diminished and, and made small. And so Jesus actually is addressing the issue of what it means to be uh, powerless in the face of the mighty. When you're the oppressed person in the face of the mighty power. In this section, he's talking especially about that. What does it mean to face, for example, uh, a Roman soldier who... So it's this, if they strike you on the right cheek, that, that specifically refers to taking your left hand and backhanding somebody, which in um, ancient uh, Palestine was like one of the worst insults you could do. If you did that to somebody, yeah, you, you humiliated them. And we're talking about an honor culture where honor is a really big deal. Okay? So this is a huge thing. So if you remember, that, by the way, these honor ideas are still around. Think back to Romeo and Juliet. One of the key moments in, in Romeo and Juliet is a fight between two characters, and it begins with these words, uh, did you bite your thumb at me? And the answer is, I did bite my thumb, but not at you. So apparently doing this was considered so heinously insulting that it required a duel to the death, and a death results. So, the, I mean, these ideas are there. When you backhand somebody, if, you, if you're ever in the Middle East and you backhand somebody that way, yet there's going to be, someone's going to die. So don't do that. <laughs> but if you're a Roman soldier, you know, they can't kill you because if they kill you, then they get crucified. If they fight back, you can kill them because they're resisting arrest or whatever. I mean, so it's this really power dynamic going on there. And so the Roman soldier gets to humiliate this Palestinian Jew and make them feel completely helpless and, and, and ashamed of themselves and angry and upset. And they get to like, derive that bully's power from putting somebody down. And Jesus says, you know what? You, I, I know how to make you powerful. He's actually saying, you're actually powerful. You don't need to feel powerless in that circumstance. If you stand up straight and offer him the other cheek, you win. This is how you defeat, you, this is how you defeat an empire. Sometimes people use the court system as a way to uh, gain power over people. You know, we hear that the threat of a lawsuit is enough to make people back away. You know, a lot of times people won't pursue what is right, uh, you know, or will give in to somebody who's pressur pressuring them if there's a threat of a lawsuit. So there are people who use lawsuits in that way. They use the power of the courts. This is especially true of the powerful. The powerful use these methods a lot because they can get away with it because the powerless don't have the resources to go to court. So they threaten a lawsuit. And, and Jesus says, if somebody sues you, fine, let them have it. They want your coat, give them your underwear too. 
By the way, that is exactly what he said. Because you're the only way two pieces of clothing in the ancient world. <laughs> so <laughs> that's. A, but what Jesus is saying is, you know, you're powerful. It doesn't you don't need those material things to be strong and mighty. The thing oh, we're afraid of losing our stuff. Don't be afraid of losing your stuff. God will take care of you. You can stand up in court and go, so okay, here. Hey, while I had it here, take my undies too. While everyone's going, <laughs> you walk out, <laughs> you win. There's power, dignity. Jesus is talking about power and dignity. And he's making another point, too, about living larger, living a larger, bigger life, a life beyond. Um, like, so there's that thing about if somebody forces you to walk with them a mile. That, Roman soldiers had the legal right to, fo- to force somebody to conscript them to carry their gear for one mile but only for one mile. And Jesus says, okay, so you have to do the one mile. That's what the law says. But you can do the next mile too as an act of of compassion and kindness. In other words, you can be bigger than the law. What a a crazy idea to live bigger like that, to have this idea of of abundance. Because we don't do that. We live these timid, shy lives. You know, we're always worried about what will people think of me and what will people do and how will they talk about me later? And, uh, that's part of the problem when we, when we talk about, uh, anytime we talk about finances in the church, you should hear our, our, um, pretty much every finance uh, meeting ha- at some point, the conversation goes, how are we going to pay our bills? A lot of hand wringing, you know, uh, we don't have enough money. And, uh, <laughs> and you heard what Phil said. Yeah, tithing church never has to talk about that. So, you know, somebody in there, often me, goes, yeah, we should just tithe. <laughs> you know, tithe, by the way, is 10%. Um, one of my clergy colleagues wisely said, you know, if you can't live on 90%, you can't live on 100%. Interesting. But, um, but we always see it in terms of scarcity. We just don't have enough. There isn't enough. We can't do enough. We can't, we can't think enough. And, and so you start talking about doing something, Right? If a crazy idea goes to somebody's head, like, I don't know, use the north, that huge acreage to the north of us and build something there that's a benefit to the community, we're like, oh, we couldn't possibly afford to do that. How could we do that? We don't have the money. Do you know how this building got built? It was back in the early 60s, and the old red brick building was called, it was downtown, First Methodist Church downtown, uh, was falling apart. It would be very, very, very expensive to repair because they, they hadn't really done a perfect job of keeping some of the upkeep, and there was a lot of stuff that was crumbling. And so it was, we either spend a ton of money to fix up, to sort of refix up this building uh, and repair the things that are just starting to, you know, or we build a new one. And, and so here was this guy, this pastor, Earl Lindsay, had this idea, you know, let's dream bigger. Let's imagine a church, not that holds you know, uh, 150 people and stuff, but a church that could hold a couple hundred people, a church that could accommodate a larger congregation, a church that could be more, bigger, a church that could do something, a church that could have not only a vision for its, for its start, but a vision for its future as well. And, and, and he, he, he was like, yeah, let's go. And they had a vote. You know what the vote was? This is my understanding of how the vote went. I was told that the vote was uh, 100 people against, 101 people for. That's what I was told. Now, I got to tell you that as a, as personally as a pastor and the way that I, I would operate from a system standpoint, if I got a vote like that, I said, we are not doing this until we get a super majority. And we're going to keep working on this until we've convinced another third of you people that you think this is a good idea. Um, but that's not what Earl did because Earl was thinking big. You know, I'm, I'm, more, I'm a more conservative guy. Earl was not. He, he was thinking big. He was thinking, what can we do? And so he said, okay, let's go. And they did. They built this building in the 60s and on, you know, what everyone was like, what are you doing building there? They're, that's the edge of town. Nobody's out there. You know, you're building next to a swamp. What's wrong with you people? Right? We've got one of the best locations in the city. This, this building, because, because, and some of you were there for this, so you know what I'm talking about. Because you guys did this, this, this is a blessing in this community. Just think about, forget what we do here. Think about the other stuff that happens here because of this building that was built. Vacation Bible School, uh, Blood Drive, the, the Little School, um, the, the Scouts. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that happen in the community that bless the community that are only possible because... Some people had some vision, and they thought bigger. They thought, let's do something big. Let's really push it out there. Let's stretch it. 
And Earl's vision actually included doing some kind of, I learned this um, actually just recently, uh, he actually had a vision of building like a retirement facility or some kind of senior facility off on the north side of the church. He had that in his mind. It didn't happen, except he didn't give up on that vision. He helped with the building of such a place in the Milwaukee area. See, he didn't give up on that vision. That vision was strong for him. He said, we can do this. He believed it could be done. And we, we don't, we're like, oh, we can barely pay our bills. How would we ever do something like that? You know, we talk about God being a mighty God, God the God of the superlatives. Like my uh, least favorite contemporary Christian music song, Our God is an awesome God, he reigns from heaven on high. I hate that song. My apologies to any of you who love that song. I hate that song. I hate the verses more than the chorus, but I actually hate the whole song. Uh, but here's the thing. That language, the way we talk about God, God is awesome, God is mighty, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. We talk about God in such tremendous ways. You know, we serve the God who created the heavens and the earth. Pre preachers love to stand up and talk and say things like, there are a hundred billion stars in the galaxy and a hundred billion galaxies in our galactic cluster. And, you know, like, we get, and God is bigger than them all. We go, oh, wow, yay, that's fantastic. And then we say, and so let's do something fantastic for the Lord. And we're like, oh, yeah, yeah. Maybe I can increase my giving by $5 a month, <laughs> right? That's how we think. Maybe I could do one extra thing a year, you know? We live so small, so timid. We're so afraid. What if we fail? What if we, what if we decided to try something really big and it didn't work? I don't know about you, but I'd rather try and fail than not try. I really, I mean, I really would. I would rather jump in and, and see if something can be done and if it can be done, hallelujah. If it can't be done, okay. Now, I'm not saying we don't do our due diligence. Jesus does say you don't build a tower until you count how many bricks you have. Okay, but I would love to just try something. We were talk I was talking to Pastor Jared this week, um, and he told me a really cool story. He, I don't know if you know this. His, his grandfather died uh, uh, last, I think, last Friday. And um, so the funeral was... Sunday and the uh, burial was Monday, so he's been he's actually been really sad this week. If you if you talk to him and he seems a little flat and kind of dull to you, that's the the grief. But he said something about his grandfather that I thought was really cool. His grandma and his grandpa were mis medical missionaries in the Congo in the fifties, and the joke is they went there with only a sack lunch and a car. There was nothing. They go someplace and there's nothing. And he wants to start this this mission work, and so. They've got, to, they've got to build a clinic. And so you start build, you know, build the walls. But you know, you, got, you can't have the wind blowing through in the sand. You have to have really secure walls. So they have to make mud bricks to brick up the place so it can be secure, so they can actually run a medical clinic there. And then he has a vision later on to build um, a hospital. Now, here's the thing about building a hospital. You can't build a hospital with mud bricks. They, they, they're not strong enough to support the weight of the building. And so, and there was nothing there. So you know what he did? He packed up and went home. No, that's not what he did. <laughs> he started a brick-making factory. By the way, brick-making is not an indoor job. It's an outdoor job. So when you say factory, it's really an open space. But li maybe we should use the word operation. He starts a brick-making operation. They made the bricks. He didn't look around and say, we don't have the capacity to do this. He looked around and said, how can we get this done? And they did. They built the bricks. The hospital still stands today. Yeah. How's that for impressive? How's that for thinking bigger? How's that for, for, for thinking beyond? How's that for that what we call second mile? You know, going, you know, I can go a mile, but I can go two. I can do more. I don't have to sit here and sit around and think, I just don't have, well, there's nothing I can do. I wish I could make a difference. It is possible to take a view that is larger, to have a dream that is bigger, and to reach out in a way that more accurately reflects the fact that I actually believe God is a mighty God. And that as God's one of God's children, I have access to that might, to that grandeur. If I really believe that, then it shouldn't be a problem for me to ask and imagine the question, you've heard this question before, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? Well, what would you do if you knew that whatever you tried in the name of God would be a blessing and a success? It might not be the success you imagined, it might not look exactly the way you thought, but God would honor it and use it. What would you do if that was the case? 
Can you find now the prayer of response? Let's pray that together. I live such a small life, tentative and cautious. It is as though I do not believe that my walk with you is the mere beginning of an eternity of love. So while I profess a theology of superlatives, God is great, awesome, almighty, majestic, and worthy of praise, I live a life of feeble scarcity. But where is the value of living such a timid life when I have access to unlimited resources? Open my arms wide, O Lord, to embrace a horizon of possibility. Open my heart wide, O Lord, to love beyond my fears. Open my resolve wide, O Lord, to dare even more than I have dreamt. Let me serve you abundantly, trusting ever in your abundant grace.